In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today's Chaplain's Report does come from the book of 1 Samuel. We are continuing our series in 1 Samuel, and you may recall from the other day that when we left off in this story, what had just happened is that the prophet Samuel called upon God to bring down a thunderstorm. Actually, it, it's kind of vague in the scripture whether or not Samuel requested that or God was going to send it anyway, and Samuel was just basically informing the people that this is what God was going to do. Either way, it's the wheat harvest, and a giant storm is coming the way of Israel as a reminder for the sin of asking for a king, even though God had repeatedly told them no. They continued asking for a king. They continued insisting upon it. So eventually, what happened is God said, all right, fine. You want a king? You're getting a king, but I warned you against it. And because of this sin, this is what happens, and this is the reaction that Israel has to this event taking place. You can see there in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 19 through 25. Then all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, so that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. Samuel said to the people, Do not fear, you have committed this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. You must not turn aside, for then you would go after futile things, which cannot profit or deliver, because they are futile. For the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name, because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. But I will instruct you in the good and right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, both you and your king will be swept away. In this particular passage, I think there are really four big lessons that we can take from this. The first one that we see very early on in, the first, in, in verse 20 there is that God is merciful even in punishment. This isn't a question about whether or not Israel is going to sin. That has already taken place. So even when God is delving out punishment, even when he has made his judgment, that was wrong, and even when he says this is going to be the consequence for that wrong action, even at that point he is merciful because it says that the children of Israel understood that what they had done is worthy of death. By the way, that's no different than the sins that we commit as flawed human beings today. When we make a mistake, we know, based on the scripture, we know based on Paul's writings in Romans, for example, that all of sin and come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin are death. And yet, God continues to let us live. He continues to allow us to grow and to try to learn from our mistakes. This is something that Israel had to learn in this moment. That, yeah, I mean, that happens, but... As horrible as it was, and as scared as they were at the, the reaction from it, he says, but God is going to let you live. God is not going to destroy his people because of this sin. He is going to allow a level of repentance to take place. So even then, God is merciful. Number two, punishment is a call for correction, not destruction. So if you'll see there in verse 21, one of the things that Samuel is trying to convey to them and address them is saying, look, just because this happens, don't let this be a cause to turn you away from God. Now, sometimes, whether it's a punishment directly from God or something that's just the consequences of our own actions, in other words, we define God and something really terrible happens to us as a result of our own bad decision making, a lot of people use that as an opportunity to say that God has somehow wronged them or he's not looking out for them. Samuel is pleading with them not to do that. 
He's saying, look, this is something that is done for your benefit, it is done for your correction, and you should remember this and move forward. But don't let it be the thing that causes you to stop serving the Lord. If anything, this should be something that brings you closer to God, something that brings you to Him, that reestablishes that relationship. And so this is something that Samuel is saying to Israel, but it could just as easily be said to us. When you sin, when you have done wrong, when you feel the consequences of that sin, whether they're self-imposed or, or whether it's a happenstance or whether it's God directly doing something to intervene, that should be an opportunity to bring you closer to God, to make you more want to serve Him, not to drive you away. See, that's the purpose. God isn't trying to drive us away when those things happen. He's trying to correct the bad behavior so that He can be closer to us. In the same way that a parent punishes their child, hoping that the child's behavior will adjust so that they can actually have an opportunity to be closer to that child because they are made better by that. God is doing exactly the same thing to Israel here. The third big thing is that even when people are wrong, even when people are wrong and we know that if we didn't take part into it, it, it wasn't us, it's still incumbent upon us to pray for them. Samuel didn't want a king. Samuel did not commit this sin. He is not the person that wanted Israel to have a king. He wanted them to stay under the judges system the way that they always had. He was actually distraught when Israel asked for a king. And so you could kind of understand from a human standpoint, looking at it through the world's eyes, why Samuel could kind of look at this and go, well, I wasn't involved. You guys pray to God for forgiveness yourself. Samuel doesn't do that. In fact, Samuel says it would be a sin for him to stop praying for Israel. That's really powerful. And I think it should be a reminder to us that, that let's say maybe a person or even a large group of people within our church, that they do something that's horrible. We have options there, right? We could do nothing. Or we could look at them and just kind of flip our nose up at them and go, oh yeah, you were one of the ones that was engaged in that. I don't want anything to do with you anymore. But Samuel says the only non-sinful option in that situation is to pray for them to pray that their relationship with God would be reestablished, to pray that they would come to repentance, to pray for their, their welfare and well-being. That's what Samuel does, and that's what you're supposed to do. You know, we've talked an awful lot the past couple weeks, and I think rightfully so, about unity and disunity, about things that can cause divisions in the church. You know, one of the things that can cause those divisions is when somebody screws up and does something wrong, even if they are legitimately in the wrong, and even though the other party may legitimately be in the right, if the party that's in the right can't forgive them. Think about the story of the prodigal son. The older brother, he does the opposite of what Samuel suggests here. He's the one that doesn't want anything to do with his younger brother, that holds a grudge against his younger brother because of what he did. That he looks down his nose at him. And Samuel is saying, do the exact opposite. I want Israel to be right with God. I want all of you to have the kind of communion with God that I have. Therefore, I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to help you get there. And I think that that's powerful as well. And then the fourth one, and it's kind of a tagline at the end of it there in voice, verse 25. But he says, yeah, remember that uh, if you break my covenant and if you turn away from serving the Lord that you and your king are going to get swept away. And by the way, if you know your Bible history, it turns out that was absolutely true. Not only is half the kingdom lost, and, and there's a divided kingdom after King Rehoboam, but even after that, we see the, the Jewish captivity with Persia, we, Babylon, whatever you know, country that was in control of them at the time you want to use. We see that the northern kingdom was taken away by Assyria, and so when Israel refused to do what God asked them to do when they turned away from serving God, they and their king were taken away. And I think that goes along with the overall message of this story, which is, remember that I'm God, I'm really your king, your king is just a steward of the authority that I have imparted to him. He's not your ultimate commander, he is not your God, I am your God. And so, when he says that, 
what he is trying to convey to them is that don't think that just because you have a good king that you're going to be in good standing with me because he is. And don't think that your king is going to protect you from other nations. I'm the one that does that. And so if you want to be in good standing with me, you can't do it through your king. You have to go through me. You have to have a right relationship with me in order to do that. And so I think that's a powerful takeaway for that lesson. That ultimately, that's the impression that God wanted to leave them with. That I'm the one, no matter who is on the throne of Israel, that should sit on the throne of your heart. Stay the course, friends. So now they have this fancy new technology where you click on one of these boxes and it takes you to another one of my videos. Hopefully it works a lot better than the Obamacare website or the DNC's Iowa caucus app. Gotta love that big government central planning.